We have Starbase road closures, but these aren't for an actual flight prototype, so what are these for? That's a good question we'll be answering. We also have the construction of the second tower at Starbase, we have tons of tire work, and of course, we have SpaceX working around the clock getting the spaceport ready for a potential catch attempt of a super heavy booster. There's all of that and more coming up in your Starbase update, sponsored by Opera. Let's start our weekly journey at all the non-flight hardware work that SpaceX has performed in the last week to prepare for the future. Over at the tank farm, work is ongoing to remove some of the old tank shells, which were part of the old vertical tank farm. This tank farm, as I hope you all remember, was decommissioned and is being removed as the new horizontal tank farm expansion takes its place. What we can see here is the load spreader being attached to GSEC-4, one of the remaining shells, which is done to spread the load for the crane. It is a little bit, you know, in the name. Here it's super clear where the tanks are being separated as SpaceX works to break them up into smaller, more manageable sections for scrapping. And then after some more cutting, this shell at the tank farm was lifted. It was placed next to the orbital tank farm where it faced some slicing. I'm calling this a shell because it's a shell, it's not the tank that's inside. Inside of these shells is a Starship-like tank that was produced very similar to how the Starship prototypes were produced back in 2021 and was isolated using the bigger white shells with some perlite in between. We've seen perlite trucks going back and forth to the launch site for many, many, many weeks at this point as the perlite was removed prior to all of the shell removals. At the time of recording, a second shell, GSEC-5, has been lifted and removed. That happened at the exact same time as another lift, but we'll get onto that later. The chopsticks also saw some work this week as teams are inspecting the hardware after Flight 4. This item is of course an even bigger focus this time around, with SpaceX seemingly going for a catch attempt on Flight 5. So of course, they want to make sure that this critical catch hardware is in good shape ahead of this significant first attempt to catch a super heavy booster. The ship quick disconnect is also seeing some work using an extended crane to reach it. It seems that SpaceX is at least performing some sort of maintenance to it after flight. This is a bit different to what we saw between Flight 3 and Flight 4, where it seemingly sought no attention at all. Part of this work saw the movement of the entire plumbing structure on the QD, which was lifted and then put back into place. Interestingly, it remained off angle for quite some time as workers were working to straighten it back up. One more lift and it was back in place where it belongs. The orbital launch mount is also undergoing inspection and refurbishment work after the flight. It seems to be in a fairly good shape after the liftoff of the fourth Starship stack, but of course SpaceX is not in the fully rapid reusability phase of the program just yet. It's a few more years down the line, so intense inspections between flights are absolutely to be expected, and we shouldn't worry about it at this point in the program. The plumbing and smaller, more delicate parts of hardware are probably enduring additional scrutiny. Just before the severe storm struck this week, SpaceX received delivery of another massive horizontal hot dog tank, which was positioned at the launch site. This tank will probably fill one of the two sets of foundations we spotted during last week's flyover, and if you haven't watched that yet, then go watch it. It'll probably appear, like, right there. Now we are seeing something that we haven't had the chance to view up close in a little while. A massive, super heavy transfer tube was being moved around in preparation for potential installation into a booster in the future. However, we are not certain which specific booster this transfer tube belongs to. At the top of the tube, you can see the filter system, which has been a significant topic of discussion in recent Starship flights. This transfer tube is not just a simple tube, it also includes vital components that contribute to the success of the super heavy system. Checking in with the new car park, it's interesting to see how quickly and easily such a structure can be built at Starbase. From the outside, it looks practically finished, and it would not be surprising if we see this multi-story car park in use very soon. A significant reduction in the number of cars parked along Highway 4 will be a telltale sign that this structure is open for business. Progress at the office building is a little bit slower compared to the rapid pace of the car park construction, but it's still moving at a relatively fast pace in, you know, worldwide terms. The office building has been receiving more of its floors or ceilings over the week. This building seems to be more complex than the car park, so it will likely take a bit longer to become operational. One big infrastructure item, both in terms of size and historical importance, of course, is the construction of the second orbital launch pad's tower. But just before we check in on that, 
Sawyer has a word from today's sponsor. I'm sure I'm not alone when I say I love Starship and that I love learning all about Starship in between the different flights. Now, there are two tools that I use to keep up to date. One, Alex's spreadsheets. And two, one that you can also use, is the Opera browser. First off, if there's a quick question, I can just ask Aria, the built-in AI. It's connected to the web so it stays up to date and I can even just right click on text to get some context. Of course, I end up reading a lot of NSF articles and L2 forum posts. Trust me, the tab count gets to be ridiculous. Thankfully, Opera has tab islands, which help keep them all neatly organized. And if it gets too overwhelming on the toolbar, I can just hide them away until I need them again. Then it's super easy to share what I find given the built-in messengers on the sidebar. We're talking X, Telegram, WhatsApp. It's really helpful. It's also super safe since it's set up with privacy and security in mind. Free VPN for sketchy websites or connections? Check. A site with sketchy pop-up ads? Well, use the built-in ad blocker. Plus, it's customizable. I'm sure Jack is going to hate me for my browser background. Download Opera for free by clicking the link in the description below. That way, they know NSF sent you. Now back to another great Starship resource, Starbase Update. The construction of the second orbital launch pad's tower is progressing rapidly, with the first level's pillars already visible. This development is part of SpaceX's broader infrastructure expansion to support the growing operations at the site. The new pad will require not only the tower itself, but also a second orbital launch mount and various supporting infrastructure, although SpaceX has already confirmed both pads will share one tank farm. The location of the second pad has been strategically chosen, as it is situated at the edge of their land where the suborbital tank farm was previously located. This placement allows SpaceX to maximise the construction work before the launch campaign for the fifth flight, which may restrict access to the site. The pillars supporting the tower are indeed massive, as evidenced by their size in comparison to the workers in the area. These pillars are being placed on a concrete foundation, which will eventually support the entire tower structure. Apart from the wall structure between the launch tower pillars has also been installed. At the bottom of the tower, the shielding is much more significant than at the top of the tower, as it has to endure the energy from the 33 Raptor engines reflecting around the site. So this work right at the bottom will probably take a bit longer before SpaceX moves to stacking the full tower. More wall sections of the ground level were installed later in the week as SpaceX already is closing the second of four walls on the ground level. Next to the tower, the Terex Daymag CC8800-1 crane that will be used to build it is also continuing to be assembled. This is of course a giant beast that could never fit down any road, so it has to be delivered in sections. I guess it could fit down the crawl away at the KSC, but you know, that, that doesn't really count. Does that count? I don't, I don't think that counts. Assembling such a huge crane is basically a construction project within itself, so expect progress reports on the construction for a few more weeks. We saw a similar process during the first tower's construction where that giant multicolored Frankenstein crane was used. That giant multicolored Frankenstein crane also lifted Booster 4 and Ship 20 onto the orbital launch mount. Now, I wonder if we've seen something get lifted onto the OLM this week that wasn't lifted by the chopsticks. Hmm, that's very interesting. You should probably stick around to the end to find out. Now, if you watched any of our underrated Starbase videos this week, you may be wondering why there was not that much footage from the 19th and 20th of June. Well, this comes down to the fact that a tropical storm hit Boca Chica in that time frame. Part of Highway 4 was actually closed thanks to a judge order because of a high risk of flooding and Boca saw over 25 centimetres of rain per square metre in a very short period of time. Part of Highway 4 actually ended up significantly flooded with mud dragged inland. In fact, at the time of recording, Sean, one of our photographers out there, has just reported that Highway 4 is still flooded just before the production site. Because of this, SpaceX slowed down the work at Starbase because it was becoming less safe to actually drive down the highway, and it's unsafe to work at height on the aerial work platforms during high winds. Remember, that ship quick disconnect arm is more than 80 meters off the ground. I think we've left it long enough, let's check in on our friend Ship 30 and where we are on the campaign to Starship's fifth flight. We've been paying close attention to the work on the heat shield of Ship 30, and spoiler alert, it's going very fast. 
SpaceX has started the process of removing and then replacing the entire heat shield, and all the layers of scaffolding around Ship 30 is evidence of that. As we saw last week, huge clumps of tiles have already been removed, and even more have been removed in the last seven days. The work here is on multiple layers at once, accelerating the process. However, it remains to be seen whether this new and improved shield will do its job. But considering the epic views we got to witness during the fourth flight, I'm pretty confident that the heat shield development will continue in the right direction. Downwards, belly first, into the atmosphere. I'm sorry, that's dreadful. One of the most delicate regions, according to Elon Musk, is the shroud around the flaps and hinges of the vehicle, so it will be interesting to observe what changes will be performed at these critical regions, in contrast to the main body of the ship. But even though the progress has been exciting, there is still a huge amount of TPS work that needs to be completed before we can even think about the next flight of Starship. We've been treated to an epic preview of what SpaceX might actually do to potentially test a catch attempt on the chopsticks, or at least simulate the load on them. The talk of the town at the end of the week was this, the B14.1 test tank, which is another of these weird little test tanks that has been floating around Boca Chica for a little while. It was rolled down the road from SpaceX's Massey's test site and continued past the production site, ending up at the launch site. It was then lifted by crane onto the OLM, something which I don't think has happened since the days of Booster 4 and Ship 20. It couldn't be lifted off the ground by the chopsticks because it's way too short. Remember, that OLM is 18 metres tall. With three 8am to 8pm road closures scheduled, it seems to be more and more likely that they will potentially fill this test tank with something until it is the mass of a booster during landing. With that, they can lift it with the chopsticks, simulating the forces and potentially test a catch manoeuvre before it actually happens for real. Of course, this would be just a vertical manoeuvre because this tank has no engines, it's not flight worthy and if they open the chopsticks, they'll just drop it. Those three road closures are currently scheduled for the 25th, 26th and 27th of June, with the primary on Tuesday, with two backups on Wednesday and Thursday. Considering that the suborbital side of the launch site has already been completely removed to make way for orbital pad B, any of these 12-hour Highway 4 closures can now only be for testing taking place using orbital pad A. With this little guy currently sitting on the OLM, it's a safe bet to say some unique testing is forthcoming. You won't want to miss it, and that notification bell down there will make sure you get notified whenever we go live with dedicated coverage. Or you can just keep refreshing the channel page for the 36 hours when this test could take place. I guess it's up to you. Another exciting thing to note is that we've seen the first license for Flight 5 of Starship. No, it's not from the FAA, it's from the Federal Communications Commission. This is the first license we see on every flight, and it doesn't really help us understand the date of the launch or anything else for the flight, but it features interesting wording. Just, just trust me on this one. The FCC license leaves the option open for if the booster will either communicate during a soft water splashdown or a return to the launch site landing, known to us as a catch attempt. So it seems SpaceX is at least working on the regulatory foundation to go for a historic catch. The FAA license, the important one that says if they can fly or not, would need a modification should SpaceX go for a catch. While the license in its current form allows for similar prototypes to fly a similar trajectory to Flight 4, it does not allow for a catch attempt just yet. But with no mishap investigation required for Flight 5, this could all come relatively quickly. So we're keeping our fingers crossed this is actually the case, and we see both hardware and regulatory readiness quicker than on previous campaigns. Wonky test tanks, potential catching, it's all starting to feel much more exciting. And that second Starbase launch tower is keeping the usual post-flight lull of activity away. Once again, thanks to Opera for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to download Opera for free using the link in the description. I'm Ryan Cades for NSF, thanks for watching, and goodbye.